OK. Um, for chapter 8, the dynamic panel data. And so the schedule is uh, we're going to uh, go over this chapter 8 and then do a quick review, summarize what we learned so far. I'll let you know what kind of question you would expect to see in the, in the midterm. Uh, dynamic panel data. First of all, what is dynamic? Dynamic means over right hand side, we have lag of Y. Over Y is YIT, right? For example, suppose Y is wage. X is a education, so on so forth. Education, working experience, your age, so on so forth. Now, the dynamic model means the lag of Y also appears as right hand side. In other words, Besides your working experience with education, so on and so forth, the, your, your wage last year also affects your wage this year. So that's basically the idea. Similarly, for example, when we talk about a firm, say when we talk about the sales, right? So besides all those axes, such as this, how large the firm is, how many workers in the firm, so on and so forth, and so they determine the sales of this year. Hence, besides all those axes, Last year, the sales of last year also affect this year, right? So, and so then right hand side, we have a lag term of uh, your Y. This model called dynamic model, dynamic model. And this idea originally come from time series. And in time series, a dynamic model means, you know, lag Y affect uh, the Y this period. Y T minus one affects Y T. So this is called dynamic model. So but panel data, we ex extend time series into panel data so that we also discuss this issue. So right here, to make the story simple, I omit X beta. But in general, of course, uh, we should put X beta all, all there. And, uh, first of all, this model looks kind of similar to the model uh, autocorrelation model we learned before. Then when we learn F-E-A-R, R-E-A-R, we learned the uh, autocorrelation, right? Last year affect this year. But at that time, the autocorrelation is in our error term, V-I-T. We assume uh, last year, the, you know, the lag of V affects, uh, affects of V-I-T this year, right? But now the autocorrelation not in error term. Actually, autocorrelation is in Y. Right, so that's the biggest the difference. Now the autocorrelation Y is right here. We call it dynamic model, dynamic panel data model. So first of all, just uh, the same as before. Uh, again, to make this story simple, I omit X beta to make our model a little bit shorter. But in general, again, we should put X beta over there to make the model general. First of all, I want to show you is uh, just like before the mu I term. Mu I term, uh, of course, we can cancel it uh, by using either within transformation so that we got our fixed effect estimator, right? Or you can use a first difference transformation so, so that uh, last year of minus uh, this year so that we can cancel out mu I, right? We have more than one transformation to cancel out mu I term. So before we explained, once we cancel out mu I, we can run the regression, for example, say Y tilde over x tilde, right? Or delta y over delta x, right? To calculate the coefficient of x, which is a beta. Beta hat we call the fixed effect estimator or first difference estimator. So that beforewards, we, without, without the lag term right here. And so beforewards, we introduce the beta hat fixed effect estimator, first difference estimator. This should be good, right? We also explain some details, uh, you know, something like, uh, F E A R Ness, these two are special cases when rho is a zero or a zero one, so on and so forth. Now, in this chapter, we're going to introduce something new, which is uh, when our x right hand side includes the lag term of y, includes the lag term of y, actually, no matter you use a first difference estimator or use a fixed effect estimator, the estimator will be wrong in general, will be incorrect. In other words, you cannot, for example, for example, if you treat this term to be one to be our x, right? So you cannot run the regression something like a y tilde over 
the tilde term of this uh, the last year. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't work. Similarly, if you do a change to left hand side, change to right hand side, if you run the regression, you know, both sides and then cancel out mu i first and then run such a regression, it doesn't work. The estimator will be biased. And so I'll show you why in detail. But first of all, bias means this is a first moment problem. First, first moment problem means our beta head is already wrong, right? Our estimator is already wrong. Before, when we talk about FEAR, REAR, the autocorrelation problem we mentioned before in that chapter is a second moment problem in the sense if you ignore autocorrelation in V, your, your beta is still correct. The only problem is not efficient. The, the variance or standard is too big, right? Not efficient, <laughs> inefficient, we call it, right? So that's why we call it the second moment problem because beta head is, they're still correct. The only problem is it may not be significant, right? But right here, if the autocorrelation is, is in your Y, then the first moment will be already wrong. So let alone second moment, right? <laughs> the, the coefficient already wrong. So we don't care, you know, stand error anymore. Let me show you why, why, you know, the, the coefficient is wrong. And so let's talk about the fir first difference transformation because that's easier. That's simple. The within transformation will, will be very similar. The tilde transformation, right? Very similar. Hence, you can you can try to derive by yourself. But I'll show you first difference. Within transformation will be very similar. So first of all, and so uh, you know, the first difference uh, transformation will be our equation three. Where does it come from? Equation three is equation one minus equation two. Equation one will be our original model, right? Again, I omit x beta to, to make this, you know, model uh, shorter. Hence, let's replace t by t minus 1. In other words, for example, if t is 1992, hence we replace t in 1992 by 1991, hence this story should be also true. For example, say, in the original model, 1992 is a function of 1991, right? Similarly, 1991 should be a function, similar function on 1990, right? So on and so forth. So that's why I replace t by t minus 1. So that if you replace t by t minus 1 right here, then t minus 1, then minus 1, then, you know, goes to t minus 2 now, right? So that's where does the equation 2 come from. Basically, I just replace t by t minus 1 so that I got to the second equation, right? I got the second equation. You replace uh, this year by last year. So I got the, that equation. So, so first equation minus second equation. So that I got the third equation. Let's see. Delta Y, change Y will be YIT minus YIT, you know, T minus one, right? This, you know, YT minus YT minus one. So I got the left-hand side change in Y. Right-hand side, Delta y t minus one minus delta y t minus two. So shorthand notation is delta change in y t minus one, right? So th this guy, the shorthand notation is first one minus second one right here. And mu i, mu i, they canceled out with each other. Speak that's the purpose of the first different transformation, right? We try to cancel out mu i. Finally, v i t minus V T V I T minus one, right? So I got change in V I T shorthand notation, right? So by the way, you know, I also, you know, if 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 we have alpha, same thing, alpha will be canceled out, right? Just like uh mu I, you know, uh constant term will be also canceled out by using the first difference. So that's the shorthand notation. Change in Y is this. Change in y t minus one is this, right? Change in v is this. So the the shorthand notation I explained everything right here. So I got to the equation here. So before words, before words, the first difference uh, transformation right hand side we got x change in x and times beta, right? Now it's a uh, our x is change in y t minus one. That that's the only difference. Now, if you run the regression change in yit or change in yit minus one, 
so that you want to calculate the coefficient delta hat. I will show you, you know, such an orderless regression, delta hat will be wrong. Delta hat is biased. Why? Very simple. I will show you in equation number three, the regressor, this guy, change in y t minus one, and the error term, change in v i t. I will show you the regressor and the error term they two are correlated so that to violate our assumption number four. So that, in other words, we have endogenous problem. Regressor error term again, I'll show you they are correlated. Why they are correlated? Let's take a closer look. The, our regressor is change in y t minus one, right? So the full notation is uh, y t minus one minus y t minus two. And so their difference is our regressor, right? And what's our error term delta VIT? It's VIT minus VT minus one, right? That's our error term. Now, by taking a closer look, you, you probably realize, see, T minus one, T minus one. So our regressor and error term, both of them contains a T minus one term, for example, our, our regressor contains y t minus one. Our error term, our error term, this guy contains v t minus one, right? Hence, y t minus one and v t minus one, they two actually, they are related. Why? Why they two are related? Come from here, right? From our equation two, you know, clearly, y t minus one is a function of a v t minus one, right? And so <laughs> equation two shows y t minus one is a function of v t minus one. That's why the two, of course, related, right? So that's why since y t minus one is a function of v t minus one, so that's why right here, y t minus one, v t minus one, they two are related, correlated, right? That's why our regressor, and our error term, they too are correlated. That's the story why. That's the reason why. So, so first of all, I showed you that uh, if you run a regression on our equation number three, all or less regression equation three, then delta hat, the coefficient from all or less delta hat is wrong because violate our assumption four. In other words, we have endogenous problem. Why we have endogenous problem? We show the regressor and error term. Both of them, they contain T minus one terms, right? One of them is a Y T minus one. The other one is a V T minus one. They two are related. That's why they are correlated, right? So that's why you cannot wrong first difference and the calculator, you know, first difference estimator. The first difference estimator of a delta is biased, right? It's biased. Then, you know, first of all, that's the problem. And similarly, I only showed you first difference transformation. If you want, you can verify within transformation. This is not required, but within transformation, same thing. Over after the tilt transformation, your regressor and your error term Gonna have contains, uh, you know, same time period as well, so that uh, they two will be also correlated, right? So, so that's when, you know, after a transformation, after transformation, once you solve the problem caused by mu i, once you solve the problem caused by mu i, actually you, you, you create a new problem, right? You create a new endogenous problem, right? So that's why people, oh gosh, what should I do? I solve the mu-i problem, but a new problem happens, right? So what should I do? Hence, I'll tell you the solution in a second. But first of all, this problem, this problem is first studied by, you know, uh, pointed out by the two, and it's a NACO 1981, given 1995. So especially the first paper, NACO 81. So uh, some some textbook call it NACO problem, so on so first. And uh, so that now we know you cannot run all or less uh, on equation three. If, to solve the problem, to solve the endogenous problem, we know the solution should be 
find an instrument so that we can run two stage least the square, right? So that's the solution. That's the bad news. You have to look for instrument. The bad news is that you have to do two stage square by using instrument. But the good news is that actually we can find instrument within the system, just like kind of like Hausman Taylor estimator. And so, although you have to look for instrument, but instruments is available within the system. Of, you know, you, you the, the variables we have in hand can already help us, you know, so provide the instrument, right? You don't have to look for instrument from outside our data set. So let's see what kind of instrument we can find within the within the system. The solution is uh, proposed by Anderson and Shell 1982. Shell, you know, if you remember Shell, in our syllabus, I list a couple of uh, textbooks. And so uh, besides Bade Bataji's uh, panel data book, and so one of the panel data book is uh, by Shell, by Shell. He, he is also, you know, a panel data guy. Anderson is his student. So they too, they too studied this dynamic panel data and uh, proposed a solution to this uh, dynamic panel data. They, they propose uh, instruments. What kind of instruments uh, Anderson the Shell proposed? Very, very simple. They simply proposed, we can run a two-stage list square, change of y or change of uh, y t minus one by using instruments y t minus two. By using instrument y t minus two. That's the instrument Anderson and Shell proposed. Let's check out why. Why this instrument work? And still remember, you know, the, the uh, requirements of instruments. To be a solid instrument, our instrument has two requirements. First of all, our instrument need to be related to our regressor. Our, uh, let me... For example, suppose your instrument, let's call it uh, Z. Z, first of all, Z, first of all, uh, first of all, Z need to uh, be correlated with our X. Our instrument be called relevant condition, right? Z, instrument Z has to be related to our X endogenous variable, right? So that's related to each other. We call it a relevant condition. Second uh, requirement is uh, Z has nothing to do with our error term. We call it exogenous condition. And so that, uh, you know, Z has nothing to do with the error term, right? And so that's the two conditions we introduced uh, last semester. And so, again, first condition, Z related to our regressor. Second condition, Z not correlated with the error term, right? So let's check out why our instrument right here satisfies the two conditions. The, the instrument understand the shell proposed is, let's use uh, Y uh, I T minus two. T minus two. Let's check out why this guy T minus two, why T minus two satisfy these two conditions. First of all, first thing first, relevant condition. Why T minus two? It has to affect our regressor right here, right? They two need to be, uh, you know, related to each other. Are they related? Are you know, are, are they related to each other? What do you guys think? Probably yes, right? <laughs> Why? Any comments? <laughs> Let's take a closer look at our regressor right here. Our regressor again, change in Y I T minus one. If you take a closer look, our regressor is Y T minus one minus Y T minus two. See y t minus two right here, <laughs> right? Actually, it's part of a regressor, right? So of course, you know, y t minus two gonna affects our regressor because y t minus two is part of a regressor, right? So if you check out the correlation between the two, of course they are related, right? So the first condition, relevant condition, will be very easily satisfied, right? So, so the first condition, 
you know, our instrument y t minus two definitely gonna affect our regressor right here. Second condition, second condition, y t minus two needs to have nothing to do with our error term, right? As let's see how our error term, if you take a closer look, our error term is a v i t minus v i t minus one, right? They come from the period t and t minus one, right? So that how about our instrument? Our instrument is a y t minus two, right? T y t minus two, y t minus two. You know, for example, y t is a function of a v t. Y t minus one is a function of a v t minus one. Similarly, right here, y t minus two is a function of v t minus two, right? So. So again, y t minus two basically is a function of v t minus two, right? So as long as we can argue v t minus two has nothing to do with the two, then we finish the the proof, right? So and so how to argue v t minus two has nothing to do with the two? And basically, actually, this is an additional assumption. As as long as v is not auto time over time, not not auto correlated over time, right? So, in other words, if v i t is say i d over over time, and so uh, the error term v i t last year, this year, so on and so forth, is, uh, you know, not correlated, then v t minus two has nothing to do with a uh, v t minus one. V t minus two also has nothing to do with a uh, v i t, right? So that uh, basically, as long as a uh, v i t, those are random noise, right? And so the second condition, relevant, you know, uh, exogenous condition will be satisfied, right? So right here, you know, we already finished checking the, those conditions, right? But keep in mind, right here, the second condition, we need the v i t to be uh, random noise. In other words. VIT needs to be over time. There's no autocorrelation, right? At this moment. So that later on, we, you know, we, we're going to discuss what if, uh, VIT really autocorrelated, then what shall we do? Actually, very simple. Just say, uh, you know, by using transformation, we can solve the autocorrelation problem, right? But at this moment, to, to treat it as simple so that uh, let's assume VIT is ID. VIT is not autocorrelated, right? So that right here, why t minus two could be used as as an instrument, and so, so that we can run two stage least the square, um, we can run two stage least the square. So understand the shell estimator will be a two stage least the square of our change in y or change in y t minus one by using instrument y t minus two, right? So that's the Anderson and the shell estimator. Actually, you know, Anderson shows such as, you know, you can either use, uh, either use a y t minus two or use a change in t minus two. Either use a change in t minus, because change in t minus two will be t minus two minus t minus three, right? As, a, as in other words, t minus three actually also could be used in instruments. So either, either use a t minus two or change in t minus two, either one. Of course, uh, directly, you can directly use a y t minus two. That's easier. So understand the shell proposed instruments so that we solve the problem by using two stage least the square. Again, for to us, you can make it make it easy. Just uh, just uh, uh, to, to you know, just remember use instruments y t minus two, right? Y t minus two as instrument. That's the Anderson and the shell estimator. It's in nineteen eighty two. Anderson and the shell, they are the first one. Uh, first the ones who solved the problem. Uh, the later on, you know. At this uh, at this stage, nobody use uh, understand the shell estimator anymore because at, at this moment, you know, and now we have even better solutions. Better in the sense, actually, later on, we find uh, better solutions that that's even more efficient than understand the shell. In other words, understand the shell proposed uh, instrument, right? But later on, people find out actually. 
if t, y t minus two could be used instrument, actually we can find more instrument. For example, y t minus three can be also a used instrument, right? Why? For example, the two conditions you can verify them, you know, one by one. For example, for example, y t minus three kind of affects the our regressor right here. Why? Because because y t minus three kind of affects y t minus two. Y t minus two affects t minus one, right? So on and so forth. By using these kind of arguments, y t minus two also affects our regressor, right? Similarly. Y t minus three has nothing to do with a regressor by using the same argument because y t minus three basically contains v t minus three, right? By using exactly the same argument, just now we argued v t minus two has nothing to do with a v t minus one or v t, right? So same argument, so that v t minus three also has nothing to do with a error term, right? So that if if y t minus two could be used instrument, then y t minus three could be also instruments, right? And then not done yet. If t minus three could be used, <laughs> then how about y t minus t minus four, t minus you know five, so on and so forth. Basically, you know, basically all those selects before, right? For example, for example, suppose that this year is let's say uh, two thousand. Then all those uh, past years we had before, for example, 1999, 1998, you know, and no matter how many years, uh, basically all those years we had before in our data set, all of those, those previous years could be used instruments, right? So actually we have many, many instruments in, the, in hand, right? That's why understand the shell first propose a solution. Later on, people realize actually, Actually, we have uh, even more instruments, right? So, so we have more than necessary. As long as you find one instrument, it's enough. But if the more, basically, the more better, right? And so we have, we, you can find two instruments, three instruments. You know, if you have many, many years before, you can, you have many, many instruments. We have more than necessary, right? So the question is how to use these more than necessary instruments. We have so many instruments, how to use them efficiently. The solution is called right here. Arellano bound estimator. Arellano bound estimator. What's Arellano bound estimator? In short, it's a GMM estimator. So if you're not familiar with a GMM, not a problem. I'll, I'll explain briefly what it is. Very simple. And so basically, you can understand GMM as a fancy version of uh, uh, two stately square. Two stately square is, uh, you know, we find, we solve the problem by using instrument, right? Hence, for example, say, uh, if you have one dot in this problem, you need one instrument. If you have two in, in, you know, if you, if you find two instruments, then of course, even better. If you have three instruments, you know, the more looks uh, at the, the better, right? <laughs> now the question is, uh, when you have so many instruments, how to use them efficiently? Because some instrument might be better than others, right? So in this case, maybe, you know, if you directly use a uh, two city square, basically the computer going to allocate exactly the same weights to those uh, instruments right for example if you have uh, if you have 10 instruments then each of them has the same weights this may not be the perfect weights because some instrument might be better than others right so the ideally let's allocate weights based on which one is more relevant right so the, the solution GMM is let the computer to determine what's the best weights to each instrument. For example, maybe maybe the first in instrument should contain, say, maybe, say, 80% weights. Maybe second instrument, maybe only, say, 10% weights, right? Maybe the third instrument, maybe 0% weights, right? So on so forth. So let the computer to de de determine the optimal weights, the best weights for those instruments, right? If you have only one instrument, you don't have to determine. You Everything, 100% weights goes to that instrument, right? So if you have more than necessary, when you have two instruments, you need to determine, are they 50-50? or maybe 80, 20, so on and so forth, right? So that, in that kind of situation, the solution is a GMM. 
generalized matter of moment. Generalized in the sense, you know, whenever you have、um, the term generalized, usually we try to gain efficiency. Try to gain efficiency. Try to allocate the weights among those instruments. Try to try to get it more efficient than than to state least square. That's basically the idea of a GMM. So, Arellano Bond, 1991.、Uh, they proposed the GMM by using instruments, for example, all those legs. For example, say. Anderson the show only proposed y t minus two only last year, right? That two years ago, two years ago, and Arellano Bond proposed、uh, three years ago, four years ago. Actually, you know, starting from the first year until two years ago, right? All those previous years could be used instrument, and、uh, let's use GMM to determine which instrument deserve more weights. Right, <laughs> that's the solution of、uh, Arellano Bond estimator. As nowadays, basically everybody uses Arellano Bond estimator. So Arellano Bond estimator is more popular. Understand the shell? That's the very first one who solved the problem. But nowadays,、uh, nobody uses、uh, Arel. You know, understand the shell? <laughs> everybody uses Arellano Bond estimator. Um. Uh. Um. Arellano. Arellano. Also, in our syllabus, we I also list a book by Arellano. He is also, you know, Shell and Arellano. They too. Now you guys know their contribution.、Uh, both of them, they are,、uh, you know, they are dynamic panel data guys, right? <laughs> so that their book is better in this dynamic panel data chapters. So that if you, especially if you care more about this dynamic panel data. Then you know Arellano's book and Shell's book might be more interesting, right? But in general, Betty's book is、uh, is is better in the sense for general general topics of panel data. Betty's book is overall is better. That's the idea. Bond is from、uh, UK. It's、uh, the same last name as James Bond, zero zero seven. So, so <laughs> Arellano Bond estimator. Uh, I'll show you an application. I directly use a PDF to show you application. the 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 state do files is on、uh, you know on Canvas. You can download and try. Very very simple. So in this application, we're gonna replicate this regression.、Uh, by default, we always do the one way model. So our y log c c is a.、Uh, uh, Uh, L and C C should be consumption. There is a log of a real, a、uh, real capital sales of cigarette per person of smoking, and the、uh, right hand side of variables so they are、uh, a function of、uh, price of cigarettes, which is L N R P real price, and、uh, what's this one? Log of a minimum real price of a neighbor state. R P N N stand for neighbor. Basically, not only not only this location price in this state, right? Price in my neighbor state also affects my consumption because, for example, say if I I talk about、uh, say New Jersey and、uh, Pennsylvania. Suppose I live in New Jersey, and、so, suppose New Jersey's price cigarettes is high, but Pennsylvania is low, right? Maybe I drive You know, cross and <laughs> cross a state borders. Go to the other state to to buy cigarettes, right? So that's why my neighbor price also affect my consumption, right here. And next one,、uh, log RDI RDI there it is. Log of real、uh, per capita disposable income. Basically,、uh, this is a classical issue.、Uh, and so, what kind of variable determines my consumption? Consumption basically quantity, right? Of course, price affects quantity, right? Besides price, also my income affects my consumption, right? If I'm rich, I can buy more. If I'm poor, I can buy, I can only buy less, right? That's why you know, hence、uh, a、uh, price as on the first. Right here, we put a lag of our y, and、so、left hand side is consumption of cigarettes, and、so、right here. 
uh, in general, we all consider maybe your consum consumption from last year, right? From last period, maybe also affect consumption this year, right? And so, uh, by the way, everything is in log so that the coefficient right here, for example, beta one will be the elasticity between consumption and the price, right? So, and uh, the coefficient income right here, this is the income elasticity, right? Income elasticity. So, uh, beforewards, our computer codes, when we ignore, when we ignore the dynamic issue, when we ignore, when we ignore the lag of y, so that you can run a panel data model y over x1, x2, x3, right? For example, fixed effect estimator or first difference estimator, our command will be xt reg y x1, x2, x3, comma fe. So that right here, before we ignore the dynamic issue, we ignore lag of a y, right? And so uh, our coefficients of uh, x1, x2, x3, they're right here. For example, coefficient of price is negative uh, 0.88. Uh, it means the price elasticity is negative uh, 0 0.88, right? And it means uh, when, when our price increases by 100%, and uh, uh, the consumption going to decrease by 88%, right? Or you can say, if price increase by 1%, our consumption decreases by 0.88%, right? And so, you know, basically this elasticity is less than one, less than one in terms of absolute value, basically 0.88. Second number means our neighbor price, right? If our neighbor price, how does affect the consumption for the, my state, or consumption in my state? And finally, this, this coefficient is uh, how does my income affect my consumption? The positive coefficient, of course, uh, when my income is higher, I, I, I buy more cigarettes, right? And it's a positive coefficient. It means, for example, if my income increases by 1%, my consumption increases by 0.5%, right? Or you can say, if my income increases by 100%, then my consumption increases by 51%, right? So same thing. <laughs> and so that's the uh, result. When I ignore this dynamic issue, I only run a fixed effect estimator. Now, uh, if you want to do two-way model, just include a bunch of year dummy, or you can do include I dot here, right? The two-way model, so that I'll meet the result. Now let's see, how do we run a uh, dynamic panel data? How do I do the area learn a bound estimator? The command in stata is xta bound. Still remember the rule of stata? The second author got a full credits, right? A, a is area Bound get a full credits, right? <laughs> xta bound. So we got y, x1, x2, x3. You don't have to... You don't have to put the lag of Y. Computer gonna automatically create a lag and a put in our regressor over there. So that you don't have to you don't have to create a lag term and a put the computer. By using the XTA bound, com computer automatically, automatically create the lag term and uh, a report coefficient. Uh let's check out. Uh by the way, computer says. Our result is Arellano bound dynamic panel data, you know, estimation, right? Let's see. And so, separate two pages, but LNC, LNC L1 dot. L1 means the first lag. L stands for lag. L1 means the first lag because by default, we put the first lag, uh, first lag of Y in our right-hand side of variable, right? The computer says Arellano bound estimator. Hence, the last year affect this year. And so the coefficient of last year, the well is a 0.72. Pretty large, right? Because usually this coefficient value of rho is between zero and one in terms of absolute value. Right here, you know, last year affect this year. Last year's consumption 
you know, the coefficient is 0.72, right? Has a very big impact on this year's uh, cigarette consumption, right? Now, beforewards, beforewards, basically, when we run fixed effect estimator, we assume this coefficient is zero so that we ignore this, uh, the impact last year on this year so that we got to those coefficients. But now, as a long bound estimator, calculate last year affect this year, the coefficient pretty large, 0.72. So that everything else, x1, x2, x3, their betas will be, will be different from our fixed effect. Our fixed effect estimator, those coefficients actually, they are, they are wrong. They are biased. Now, error on a bound estimator, they are correct. For example, say, error on a bound estimator says the coefficient x1, beta1, actually only negative 0.257 negative 0.257. Recall fixed effect. Fixed effect right here. Fixed effect says negative 0.88, right? You overestimate the, the price elasticity a lot because the, the Arizona bond estimator says the coefficient of price is only negative 0.257, right? So fixed effect says zero point negative zero point eighty eight, right? Now the truth is actually only zero point two five seven, much smaller. The price elasticity is only like uh twenty five percent, right? Beforewards fixed effect says eighty eight percent, right? It's too big. You overestimate the price elasticity a lot, right? By including the by including the the lag of why we recover the truth, the true price elasticity actually much much smaller. Our neighbor's price has an impact again much smaller again zero point zero two right zero point zero two. Beforewards, our neighbor price the coefficient is right here zero point two zero right. But now Arizona bound estimator says only zero point zero two. Right, much smaller, and similarly, income effect, income effect, error Leno bond estimator zero point one six eight, right, one six eight. Our fixed effect, fixed effect again overestimate a lot. Fixed effect says zero point fifty one, right, but the you know error Leno bond estimator says only zero point. Uh, how large it is? Much smaller much smaller, only one, 0.168, right? Basically, basically, by ignoring the coefficient value right, right here, right? By ignoring the value right here beforewards, your fixed effect, assume last year, the consumption of cigarette last year doesn't affect this year, right? By treating the row to be zero fixed effect, right? Hence, so of course, you know, since you ignore the, the value of row so that everything will be biased. In other words, that's omitted variable bias, right? You omit a very important variable, which is uh, the, the, price, the consumption of uh, last year, right? So that since you omit a very important term right here, see, very significant, the p-value is zero. 0. 0.000, right? Very significant. So that since our fixed effect omit the very important variable, which is the consumption last year. So everything from fixed effect estimators, they are wrong. They're biased, right? So the fixed effect overestimate everything a lot. And so every land bound estimator, now we recover the truth. They are much smaller, right? Much smaller than fixed effect. That's basically the difference between fixed effect and uh, error Leno bound estimator. So this is the um, the one way model. If you want to do two way model, just include a bunch of uh, year dummies. Just include a bunch of year dummies. That's all. The one detail, one detail right here. I use option comma two step. What does this uh, you know one step two step means? Hence, uh, uh, the error learn a bound estimator has, you can do one step or two step. In other words, you know, the, uh, by default, I remember, if I remember correctly, it should be, the default should be one step. If you do two step, basically, you, 
you you know update the formula again and try to make everything even more efficient. That's basically is the idea. That's why you know the that's the purpose of a comma two step by specify two steps you you further gain efficiency. That's basically the idea. And so you calculate once, twice, and so on, so we'll update again and again. Try to make everything more efficient. And so, uh, a technical detail right here. Uh, I use a little command to create your dummies. Beforeards, beforeards, I told you, you know, to to do two way model. You can you can use a shortened notation. I dot year right include i dot year in your regression then automatically include uh, include a bunch of year dummy so right here i show you the second way equivalent but the second way to create a bunch of year dummy which is uh if you tab tab means a tab or tabulate if you tab year comma generate a new variable i call it y r d u m short for a year dummy so by doing this tab year generate year dummy then computer gonna gonna generate your dummy for the first year, for the second year, third year, so on so forth. Computer gonna call it year dummy number one, number two, number three, so on so forth, but cor corresponded to each year. So that so that this is a very handy command. So that a one command, one line command, we can create year dummy for every single year. So that you don't have to you don't have to create year dummy for the first year and create dummy for the second year, third year, so on so forth. And so this. This command, you know, they're gonna create dummy variable for whatever years you have in your data set. So this is a very handy command. Since my year dummy is YIDUM1, YDUM2, three, so on and so forth. That's why later on, if you want to do two-way model, I put YUDUM star. Star stand for in data, star stand for whatever. Basically, no matter you are year dummy one, dummy two, dummy three, and it's basically if I specify include your dummy star, basically inclu include whatever your dummy, include all your dummies into my regression. <laughs> and so that's why this is a little little handy command in Stata to create your dummies and include include your dummy into your regression. So uh, two ways, either directly use I dot here, right? Or, you know, if you want to create your dummy, manually create your dummy, include your dummy into a regression, then I would suggest you to use my command tab here, create a bunch of your dummy. It's much easier and much easier. So two ways, whichever you, you know, like better. And so usually, usually our homework only requires one way model. The two way model right here, the, these kind of details only only for learning purpose. Usually our homework doesn't require to, to do two-way model because uh, once you can do one-way model, the two-way model will be very, very similar, right? So the, this kind of year dummy just for learning purpose, just in case later on for your own project, for your dissertation, what if uh, in case you want to do the two-way model. Our homework usually you know, doesn't require this, only require you know, one-way model. Uh, So that's the error line of bound estimator. And so that, uh, again, our computer command, you don't have to specify the lag of Y. Computer gonna automatically include lag of Y into, into your right-hand side, into the regression, right? And right here, note that my command is XT A bound. In state, uh, later on, uh, there's another command available in Stata called XTA bound two, because we already have XTA bound. So that later on, when people try to program a new command, they call it XTA bound two. And XTA bound two basically it's a uh, even more uh, complicated version of XTA bound. Basically, XTA bound two try to make more options available. So. To me, it's uh, it's too ambitious because uh, it tried to make this feature available, make that feature available, try to make many many features available, so that the if you check out the the help file, it's it's really really long, really really complicated. So uh, my suggestion is you know just use the original XTA bound unless you really want to 
do some really complicated uh, version so that uh, you can simply use XTA bound. You don't have to, you don't have to use XTA bound two. XTA bound two is too complicated to, to use. That's why to make our story simple, just use XTA bound. That's a, that's a detail. Um, almost there, almost there. We already learned, introduced the uh, Anderson, the shell estimator, uh, Arellano bound estimator, right? So we're going to introduce one more estimator called Blondo bound estimator. Bound is the same bound. Uh, question. Bond. Bond estimator is uh, better than because of that uh, random uh, error is less than that? Uh, uh, Arellano bound estimator is better, for example, in this application, better than fixed effect because, because it turns out, where is it? Um, where is it? Or Arellano bound, uh, right here. Because it turns out to the coefficient of uh, uh, y t minus one. The coefficient, in other words, we call rho. Rho turns out to be non-zero, so that if you ignore this value of rho by using fixed effect, if you ignore the rho, right? So everything, all, the, all those beta, of course, they are biased, right? <laughs> you have to consider this value because see, by using a t-test, the t ratio is large, p value is a zero, so that very significant. You sh you you should put the row over there, right? You have to put you know include the row over there. If you ignore row, there's a bias, right? That's the reason why the fixed effect estimator, or actually similarly the first difference estimator, they're wrong because they ignore the value of row, right? They assume last year doesn't affect this year. Right, but by using Arellano bound estimator, we 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 find out actually it does last year really affects this year, right? That's why we have to use a, a RLM. If uh, if you find the coefficient right here, if it's really small, close to zero, then it says uh, probably you can re simply reduce this to, for example, fixed effect estimator. Right. For example, last year, the impact on this year, the coefficient really, really small or basically zero. Then in that case, feel free to use uh, the, the original fixed effect estimator. Right. So we're trying to select basically a story depends on the value of a row. Right. If a row is, is a zero, then feel free to use the original either fixed effect estimator or first difference estimator. So, so what we learned before. Right. But if the value right here is non-zero, especially based on the t-test, uh, p-value is uh, less than 0 0.05, so that's very significant, right? We reject, and now that row, uh, uh, do we call the row or call the delta? Let's see. We probably call it the, oh, uh, we call the delta. We call the delta. So since the value of a delta is non-zero, right? So that uh, you, you, sh you should put delta over there. If you ignore the value of delta, then you're wrong, right? So that's why fixed effect, first difference, those estimators, they are wrong. Because in this case, we find out delta is non-zero. Delta is non-zero. And so, um, that's Arellano bound estimator. Let's introduce one more estimator. It's called Blondo bound estimator. Um, uh, 1998. Is called the uh, system GMM. So I'll, I'll briefly introduce what's Blondo bound estimator. Blondo bound estimator basically is another extension. <laughs> and so Blondo bound, of course, extend Arellano bound estimator, right? How does, uh, what's the extension and what's the further gain? Let me introduce uh, this way. And so on Canvas, I also post uh, this paper. By is by Morris Bond and his co-author. Morris is in Netherlands. He's my friend. He's uh, <laughs> also a panel data guy. So Morris and his co-author try to study, try to compare this kind of uh, you know uh, uh, Lano bond, Blondo bond. Try to compare what kind of situation, which one is better, so on the first. Let me show you what's their finding. 
first of all, let me introduce what they are. Let's take a look at the equation 4.3. It's a combination of uh, two parts. If you only look at the first row, if you only look at the first row, change in y is a function of change in y t minus 1, right? By using instrument y uh, t minus 2, t minus 3 is on the first. That's the error line of bound estimator we just introduced, right? So this estimator in the literature is also called difference GMM because the equation, the equation is in difference, right? I have take first difference and then do instruments, right? So the, the error line of bound estimator is also called difference D GMM, DIF GMM. And uh, later on, people also propose another GMM is a second row. Second row is we don't take difference. We directly run the regression y over y t minus one by using instruments. By using instrument, now we do you know the instruments. Let's take difference. As we run the regression two state square regression y over y t minus one. By using instruments, change in y t minus two, change in y t minus three, so on and so forth. Then this GMM is called uh, level GMM because our model, our model is in level, right? We starting with the original model already, you know, in level. Now, if you combine the two together, combine the two together, as if you call, you know, the difference. And uh, the level put the two together, right? As, in other words, we have twice amount of y, twice amount of x, twice amount of everything, twice amount of instrument, right? So this in GMM is called system GMM. As, in other words, system GMM is a combination of difference and the level GMM, right? That's a combination. As this system GMM is the estimator we mentioned just now, the Blondo bound estimator, you know, later on they proposed. So let's see what's the beauty of this Blondo bound estimator. In other words, the system GMM estimator. Let's use uh, Morrow's paper, Morrow's paper to illustrate what's the contribution of uh, uh, Blondo bound. So let's check this out. This table is a result from a sim Monte Carlo simulation. Basically, uh, Morris create the true value of a delta and compare, compare difference GMM, level GMM, and system GMM to see which one is better, right? And so uh, the difference GMM is the Arellano bound estimator. System GMM is the Blondo bound estimator, right? When the true value of, uh, we call the delta, Morris called it alpha. Anyway, same thing. When the true value of alpha is uh, 0 0.4, in other words, when delta is kind of small, let's take a look at this row. This row is uh, by, they call two slate square, but actually it's a GMM. So difference GMM, the coefficient is 0 0.364, which is kind of close to the true value 0.4, right? And the level GMM is 0.424, also kind of close to 0 0.4. One of them is smaller than the true value. The other one is slightly bigger than the true value, right? And system GMM, this is the closest to the true GMM, 0 0.0404, right? And so far, system GMM is uh, the one performs best. One of them, the difference kind of uh, uh, below than the true value. The level is kind of above true value, right? System GMM, you know, is the closest to the to the true value, right? That's the value when the true value is a 0.4. Let's check out what if the true value is a 0 0.8 when the true value is large. Let's see. Let's compare these three again. Again, we compare these three. Let's check out this row. Again, although it labeled as a two state square, but actually they are GMM. Hence, yes, the difference GMM give us 0 0.5. Again, true value is 0 0.8, but difference GMM only give us 0 0.5, much smaller than the true value, right? 
in other words, is kind of biased. When when the true value is large, difference GMM is kind of biased. Oh, uh, underestimate a lot, right? And the level GMM, again, true value 0. 0.8, level GMM is 0. 0.856, right? Kind of close to the true value, but still uh, kind of a little bit off. Finally, system GMM is uh, 0. Uh, Eight three four right again. Overall, this is a uh, performs the best, closest to, to the true value of zero point eight right. So overall, we find out system GMM performs better than the difference GMM or better than level GMM. When the value of a delta is kind of kind of small, hence you know, since all three they're kind of close. The kind of close, but system gem is better than the first two. When value of delta is large, such as a 0 0.8, then actually difference GMM is, is a lot of off. It's really biased, right? And system GMM much closer to the true value, right? So basically, based on this kind of result, but based on simulation result, basically, Morris try to say, you know, the always use a system GMM. That's the, the, the robust estimator. That's the, you know, always correct, right? But so basic conclusion is a better use system gem, which is a Blondo bound estimator, which is a, which a combination of a level and a difference, right? And then the question, let's see why difference GMM. This is a, the original error Leno bound estimator. Why difference GMM? Is buyers right here when value of delta is large, close to one. Why difference GMM error line of bound estimator is biased? Let's see why. The reason actually very, very simple. Recall. Recall when we argue, when we argue the instruments, when we argue why this guy why T minus two can be used in, as an instrument, right? Relevant condition. Relevant condition means why T minus two relevant to our regressor right here, right? Right, because we have a T minus two right here, right? But let's take a closer look. If the delta, if the true value of delta is large, especially close to one, let's see what happens. If if the value of delta right here is, is close to one, if you move this term to the left-hand side, or if you move this term to the left-hand side, right? Hence, hence, for example, if you move this term to the left-hand side, so y t minus one minus y t minus two simply equals to mu i plus v i t minus one. Again, when delta, when delta is uh, really close to one, hence the difference between the two, the difference between the two, y t minus one minus y t minus two, the difference, uh, they, you know, the difference between the two, in other words, this guy, delta y t minus two is y t minus one minus y t minus two. Actually, now the, their difference only depends on mu i and v t minus one. There's no, there's no y t minus two left over there anymore. See the point? For example, when the true value of delta is something like uh, 0 0.5, when the true value of delta is let's say 0 0.5, if you both sides, if you minus, if you minus y t minus two, the left hand side you got y t minus one minus y t minus two, right? Right hand side. This is a 0 0.5 y t minus 2 minus y t minus 2. So right hand side, we have negative 0 0.5 of y t minus 2 over there. So that it's related to y t minus 2, right? But when, when the value of rho delta right here is exactly 1, when both sides value minus y t minus 2, right hand side, we don't have any y t minus 2 left. Right. See, see the point. Let me write it down so that you can see it uh, clear. So both sides, both sides, we're gonna minus minus y 
y i t minus two. Right hand side to be also minus y i t minus two. So let's both sides, let's minus y t minus two, y t minus two to see what happens. Left hand side, y i t minus one minus y t minus two. We got delta y, uh, let me write down for you. So the left hand side, I'm kind of out of space. Um, right here. So left hand side, we have delta, delta y i t, t minus one, right? Delta i t minus one is y t minus one minus y t minus two is delta y i t minus one. This is short end notation, right? Right hand side, delta y t minus two minus y t minus two. So the right hand side should be should be delta minus one times y i t minus two, right? Plus whatever afterwards, right? I you know uh, plus me y plus uh, I just uh, dot the oops everything afterwards, right? So the point is when delta, when the true value of delta is really large, close to one. If it is one, if you plug in one right here, one minus one, it's a zero. So right hand side, we don't have any y t minus two left, right? So when delta is something like a 0 0.5, right hand side is, uh, you know, we have, for example, uh, 0 0.5 minus one, which is negative 0 0.5, right? We have negative 0 0.5 times y t minus two. So that delta t minus one is a function of y t minus two, right? But when value of a delta is exactly one or really close to one, right hand side, actually, we don't have any y t minus two left, right? So that the relevant condition actually fails if delta is one, right? The relevant condition fails when delta is one. Or strictly speaking, we say that when delta is close to one, the instrument actually is really very, very weakly related to our regressor, right? Because, for example, when delta is, say, 0 0.9, for example, right-hand side, we have only negative 0 0.1 mm -hmm. times y t minus 2, right? So the relevance condition is very weakly satisfied, so that we call it weak instrument. That's basically the problem. In other words, when delta is really large, when delta is close to 1, we have weak instrument problem. What's a weak instrument problem? Our instrument is, is only very weakly related to our regressor, right? When delta is exactly one, they don't relevant to each other anymore, right? That's why, you know, when delta is very large, such as 0 0.8, 0 0.9, or 0 0.95, 0 0.99, so on and so forth, when delta is uh, very large, close to one, the relevant condition, you know, very weakly satisfied. There, you know, our instrument, uh, although had related to our regressor, but very, very weakly related, right? The larger delta is, the worse the instrument is, the weaker the instrument is, right? That's why, that's why, you know, Morrow's paper try to show that uh, when delta is large, such as 0 0.8, the Arellano bound estimator actually got expired because of weak instrument problem. That's, that's basically the idea here. And so, so, Uh, so that's why, that's why later on, you know, Blondel bound further proposed their system, JMM, because they're trying to solve the weak instrument problem. So as long as you can argue, you know, this kind of weak instrument problem, weak instrument problem, you know, that's, uh, so we, we find out to the, uh, frankly speaking, even if a Blondo bound estimator, the system JMM estimator, when delta is uh, close to one, 
it's still kind of uh, suffer from the weak instrument problem, but much, much better than Arellano bond estimator. So fair enough, uh, you know, <laughs> so still choose a Blondo bond estimator if, uh, if you worry about this kind of problem. When true value delta is small, such as a 0.4 or 0.5, you can use either one. Arellano bond or Blondo bond, either one is fine. But when delta is large, then Blondo bond is, is still correct. Right, but Arellano bound uh, will be biased. Right. In short, if you want to be safe, you can always use a Blondo bound because uh, the system GMA is always uh, safe. So when delta is one, when delta is one, actually I, I write down this for you: delta y t minus one equals to this, so that uh, right hand side has nothing to do with a uh, y t minus two anymore. Right. So we suffer from weak instrument problem, not relevant anymore. That's the that's the issue. So how to do Blondo bound estimator? The command is right here. XT, XT, DPD, SYS. DPD stands for dynamic panel data. Dynamic panel data. SYS, of course, stands for system, you know, GMM, right? System GMM. So DPD, SYS. So the command again, Y, X1 x2, x3, comma, two step. And so, uh, since our Blondo bound estimator give us a coefficient kind of similar to Arellano bound estimator, right? 0. 0.762. So, so just a very similar, everything very similar, just a command. Arellano bound, XTA bound, right? Blondo bound, XT, DPD, SYS, right? So just now I mentioned a command called uh, XTA bound two. So XTA bound two basically try to combine, try to include all those estimators available in the literature. XTA bound two try to include uh, uh, the dis difference GMM, uh, level GMM, system GMM, you know, so on and so forth. So many, many different estimators. So you know, if you want to, if you want to check it out, XTA bound two actually has all of those estimators available. But for, for to, to us personally, I would just uh, you know make it simple. If you want to use a Blondo bound, just we can directly use XT DPD system, right? It directly give us what we want. And so, uh, and so that's exactly what what we need, uh, you know, for the Blondo bound estimator. So summarize very quickly. So and then talk about homework. In this chapter, dynamic panel data. First of all, we introduced that uh, the no matter within transformation or first difference transformation by cancel out by canceling out the mu i term by by solving the mu i problem, we introduce new problems. Right, <laughs> the new problem is the endogenous issue between our regressor and error term, so that you cannot run all or less. You have to do two steady square. We need instrument basically. Then where do we find instrument? Understand the shell proposed, we can use y t minus two, the value two years ago, right? That's error line, uh, understand the shell. Uh, later on, error line of bound estimator, they proposed actually all those terms could be used instrument, not only t minus two, also t minus three, t minus two, four, so on so All those previous here could be used instrument. That's x t a bound, right? So we can. Uh, the details actually you need uh, you need to be able to explain. For example, why y t minus two could be used instrument. The two conditions you need to be able to to argue. For example, and the y t minus two relevant to our regressor, but has nothing to do with the error term, right? And so you need to be able to argue the the two conditions. And then, then uh. Later on, we also have system GMM, which is a Blondo bound estimator. So the contribution of Blondo bound estimator is uh, because Arellano bound estimator suffers from a weak instrument problem when delta, when true delta is close to one, right? And so first of all, you need to uh, be able to argue why there's a weak instrument problem when delta is one. And it's basically right here. And so when delta is uh, close to one, I showed it exactly right here in equation number two. Our, our, you know, regressor, our regressor actually 
Right. Has nothing to do with uh, our instrument y t minus two anymore, right? So that uh, so that when delta is close to one, we have weak instrument problem. That's why we have bias. Error Lano bound estimator is biased when delta is close to one. That's why we need to blundle bound estimator when true delta is close to one, right? And the blundle bound estimator is a system gemman, which is a combination of a, a diff and a level. Right. So homework um, should be our homework. Uh, is it number five? Uh, yep. Our homework number five is um, uh. The data set, you can directly use uh, this data set, web use AB data. This is a data set uh, using original Arellano bound their paper so that you can find this data set simply use, simply use this command, web use AB data comma clear. So as long as you have internet, you should be able to find out the data set very, by using this command. Or you can use AB data set. I, I, I probably post this data set. Did I post it right here? Or maybe no. Uh, I, you know, if, but anyway, if you have difficulty uh, you, uh, uh, loading this data set, let me know. I can, I can, you know, download a copy and email to you. So in this data set, we have a couple of variables. The left hand side of variable is N, right hand side, W, K, Y, S. What are they are? N is right here. Log of employment. N is employment. Uh, w is wage. K is capital. YS means uh, log of uh, output. So basically, we try to uh, we try to study something like input output. Input is a worker's wage, uh, capital, so on and so forth. And uh, we try to study what's their impact to to our output, which is N number employment. So part A fixed effect estimator. So by default, it's a one-way model, one-way estimator. So the first line, you know, simply corresponding to our uh, our example right here, similar to our example right here, x t reg y x one x two comma f e right. So but our homework in your case is x t reg uh, n w K Y S right comma F E by using the fixed effect estimator. Part B, dynamic model. Now we use the Arellano bound estimator, right? So that command will be X T A bound, X T A bound, right? So which corresponding to this estimator right here, X T A bound Y X one X two X three, right? By using in my case as comma two step. For the homework, for the homework also with a two-step option, simply use a comma two-step, right? And so this model use Arellano bound estimator. Part C, estimate by using the Blondo bound estimator, right? Blondo bound, the computer command is right here. XT, XT, DPD, SYS, dynamic panel data system, right? Uh, hence, everything afterwards will be very, very similar, right? So the homework should be ve should be very simple. Just uh, you know, just replace my variable names, and you should be replicated those results very easily, right? So by default, they are one way model. And part D optional is uh, if you want, you can try two way model. Include a bunch of your dummy. Try the two way model, but this is not required. If you do that. Uh, you know, no bonus points. <laughs> if you don't do that one, you know, no penalty. <laughs> so it's optional just for learner purpose. If you want to, you know, practice and so try it. Otherwise, you know, if you're lazy, not a, not a problem at all. <laughs> so it's a homework number five. So, you know, that's the, uh, any questions so far about this chapter? That's everything from this chapter eight. Uh, if no question, let's do a quick uh, review 
uh, summarize what we learned so far. Question. Uh -huh. For Carlano bond estimator, uh -huh. you're saying uh, to apply weight to the instruments to be most efficient. Do you mean in terms of variance or just what specifically did you mean by that? Oh, we let computer to determine the best ways for each instrument because our instruments is a yt minus two, y my t minus three, so on and so forth. And right here, let me see, does it report to the the weights? Um, they may not report to the weights they find out, but uh, let's see. Um, No, they, they don't report the weights, but uh, uh, by default, they calculate the, the weights for each instrument and so that uh, they, they apply the best weights for. So how do we calculate the best weights? Actually, very simple. For example, say, uh, basically, you're right, based on those uh, variances. And so the intuition is uh, last semester, we learned something called the GLS estimator. Or actually, similarly, if you recall random effect estimator, right? Basically, if you want to reduce the stand error, basically the, the stand error is determined by variance of, uh, you know, variance of this, variance of that, for example, variance of mu i term, variance of uh, v i term, so on and so forth. So that basically, basically, eventually the, the variance of beta hat is determined by a bunch of, uh, a bunch of terms such as a variance of, uh, uh, meanwhile, variance of VIT, variance, uh, you know, so on and so forth, uh, uh, those uh, instrument number one, instrument number two, so on and so forth. Uh, so that uh, computer basically try different combinations to see how can we, how can we minimize the variance of uh, beta hat. That's all. So, uh, uh, but of course, uh, computer kind of smart. Computer not simply try different combinations <laughs> because that's too many combinations, you know, situations, right? Computer use a smart way, a quick way to look for, com converge to the optimal weights very quickly. So the, you know, the, it's beyond our level, but, uh, you know, basically nowadays computer is smart. Computer can, can find out the best weights very quickly. But of course, it depends on, depends on your computer speed. Uh, old days, computers are slow, so GMM might take a long time to calculate uh, the best ways. But nowadays, computers are smart, uh, pretty fast. So maybe take a one minute or two, computer can calculate the best weights very quickly. Um, all right, let's summarize what we learned. 